Yo, what's going on, listeners? Welcome to the latest episode of Can I Kick It? The number one podcast for all things black history. This is your host, as always, Elliot Barr. And is joining me is a lovely young lady that has probably created the dopest t-shirt this side of Marco Polo. It's Megan Reyes. How are you doing, ma'am? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you for having me. What a nice intro. <laughs> you know, I, look, look, look. Got to gotta make the uh, guest smile. Got to make them feel happy, upbeat. You know, I can't just bring you on to have like a gloom and doom intro. I feel the vibe of the podcast. Yeah, we got to start off smiling and laughing. Yeah, you know, it, all, it works. It works. So, oh, Megan, real quick. I want to ask you this question. Like I tend to ask most of my guests is, how did you... How did you fall in love with soccer? Or how are you starting to fall in love with soccer? Because you just said, like, before we started recording, that you were totally new to it. So what caught your attention? So I first was attracted to the game um, when I was 21, and I interned for the Portland Timbers. So I interned there. I really wanted professional sports experience. It worked out very well because I have family in Portland. And so it was it was an awesome summer internship. I was very excited, but I went in like knowing absolutely nothing about the sport, left knowing still pretty close to nothing about the sport, but I was so intrigued. I'm like, it's so beautiful. And to have that experience with a team like the Timbers where there's so much culture and passion, the game days are, you know, like none other, especially um, – in MLS. And I know that's changed a lot since then in the last like 10 years or so, but it was just such a beautiful experience. So that's what caught my eye. And then in the last, like, I'll I'll be quite honest, actually, since the 2019 cup is when I really was like, I want to start paying more attention. I want to start learning more. So it it started, yeah, about 10 years ago, but I really actually tried to become more of a student recently. Okay. Okay. So you're still fairly new to the game. I want to ask you about your time in Portland. What made you want to work for the Portland Timbers, having no idea how it was? <laughs> but, like, Portland is also talked about as one of these atmospheres where it's, like, a must-see place in American sports. How was it your experience there? And what were you doing there? Yeah, so I will be very honest with you. When I got that internship, it was the summer before my senior year of college. So I just, I really wanted a sports internship. I applied to a bunch of places close to me. I grew up in the Northwest. So I applied to the Timbers. I was semi unfamiliar with who they were because it was only their second MLS season. Um, And I got the interview and I um, really loved the people I was talking to. And they offered me the internship. And, uh, you know, I'll be very frank that it was just at the time. I'm like, cool, I got a sports internship. It's with a professional team. Like, I don't know anything about soccer, but I'm going to go into this very open minded. Um, So it wasn't even that I was so much seeking them out or seeking out experience in soccer. I just at 21, I knew I wanted to work in sports and I I, I wanted an internship. Um, but my experience was awesome. Like um, a lot of people ask like when I fell in love and it was that first game day when I got to the stadium and saw, you know, all the TIFOs, all the fans, everything, the chance. And I was like, holy cow, like I, I love this. So it was a really cool experience. I was only there for a few months. And again, you know, it was their second MLS season. There's still so much passion there, but there was very heightened passion around everything. Um, it, it was so awesome. I definitely look back on it, even though it's been almost 10 years now, as probably one of my favorite moments in my career. How dope was it to see uh, Timber Joey, right? Is that the name yeah, of that Timber okay. Joey. How, how, so when you first saw that, a man up there like cutting a tree during a live soccer game, like what was your first reaction? I was like, what? What the hell is going on? <laughs> <laughs> I mute myself like, at the right time because I laughed like crazy. super loud. <laughs> No, I was like, and then they had to explain to me like, oh, he saws off like a slab after every goal. And at the end, every time we win a match. And I was like, okay, sure. (laughs) Were you ready to call like security and be like, hey, is this a crazy guy? Yeah, yeah, it was definitely weird. But I get it. You know, Portland's weird. So it's fine. (laughs) That's the one that I've heard from a lot of people from Portland. It's like, it's it's, it's weird. (laughs) (laughs) So it was very on brand. But yeah, the first time I was like, what? What is going on here? Uh, I got you. Well, the real, not the real reason, it's a bunch of reasons why we bought you on, but one of the reasons why we bought you on is because in the realm of soccer Twitter, you are known for creating a very unique 
and dope shirt. The make sure I say all the guys, right? More disabled, more women, more black, uh, Latina, indigenous, Asian, LBTQ voices in sports shirt. Which, by the way, I promise you, I'm going to buy one. I just haven't had a chance yet, but I'm going to buy one. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> but what was your reasoning behind creating this T-shirt? And what are you hoping to see with it going forward? Yeah, I, I like this question. Um, I was brainstorming at the time. Um, I was honestly brainstorming a merchandise idea. I I have felt like I had built a good enough platform that if I put out a really cool piece of merch that I think people would have gravitated towards it, it took me a little bit of time to figure out what that was. I was originally thinking something around women in sports, but I do know a lot. I have a lot of friends in the industry that already create and sell things like that. So I didn't, and I felt like that market is a little bit diluted currently because there's, there's a lot of different um, offerings available. And I also wanted something that everybody could rally behind. I mean, anybody can be an ally, but a, like a shirt that says, I don't know, a proud woman in sports, pretty much you could assume probably only women are going to buy that. So I was really trying to think like, what is something that really any person, the whole world could get behind? And the design that we have just came to my mind. I there's no like really cool story. It just kind of came to my mind. Um, I was trying to think of something that um, included all or most because there are groups missing. Um, I can't put everything on a shirt as much as I wish I could, but that included um, the the vast underrepresented and marginalized communities. So it came to mind. Um, I didn't expect for it to become anything big. I only wanted it to go on for a couple of weeks. But my my merch vendor in LA, he always makes jokes about how my project would make a very incredible case study in social media marketing because I. I didn't really put any marketing dollars behind it. I mean, the only money I really spent was I sent out a few influencer shirts. But other than that, all of the success has come from just it going viral and, you know, people getting their shirt, posting it, their friends seeing and that big snowball effect that we all know from social media. So I would have never imagined this. I didn't expect it at all because I also knew I wasn't going in putting paid money behind posts or really spending many advertising dollars on it. Um, but it's taken off into a way that I would have never imagined. And so now at this point with it, really gaining more visibility and recognition, I would hope that the, sh the message itself actually starts to resonate and actually starts to make changes in the industry, as we've all seen in the last few days. And honestly, all of these stories that we're hearing about people's voices being um, uh, suppressed, for the lack of the better term, isn't anything new. So I would just hope that it starts to become actually change in the industry and people start to take it seriously. And it's pretty exciting because I'm seeing some of it. You know, I have friends at teams that have reached out and been like, hey, you know, my my boss, people at the company, uh, they see what you're doing and, and we want to make sure that we're more, more intentional and proactive about our hiring practices. Like, can you put out a signal boost about a job or can you recommend names that you can think of for this role? Because we want to make sure we're doing a better job at being both diverse and inclusive. So that's pretty exciting. I didn't really expect to be this like conduit, but to see that it's taken on more than just people buying merch and now people trying to affect change is really exciting. And that's what I hope to see from it. No, it, it definitely is because I think I, I was scrolling uh, on Twitter one day and I saw someone with the shirt. I was like, oh, that looks kind of cool. And I was just thinking it was a shirt that just somebody just created like out of nothing. And I kept seeing it more and more over the course of time. And of course, you know, I followed you, you follow me back. And I was like, oh, she created the shirt. <laughs> <laughs> but I never made it. But I mean, the shirt is definitely like. It doesn't have like it's not like a graphic t-shirt or anything like that, but it gets the message across about what it is and what a lot of us have been saying in you know black soccer media or you know Latin soccer media about like we want our voices to be heard more. Not just only in months where you know it's Black History Month or Latin History Month or you know mm -hmm. uh, Asian Pacific Islander Month, mm -hmm. whatever, but we want our voices to be heard every single. A month every single day and we want them to be valued just as much as our counterparts and what you're doing is pretty much that and i applaud you for it thank you that means a lot yeah i mean that's all i that's what i want to do personally and professionally is make sure that 
any platform that I've been able to make and build that I can do something meaningful with it. I mean, any person can be like, have tons of followers and be verified and have a platform. But I think where a legacy can be made and where people can be impactful is what you actually do with that. And so I've always been about giving back to the community or trying to do something good. I did, I mean, I also like to stay busy. I did some a, a similar ish project last year, especially around a lot of the social justice um, movements. But I always just try and use my platform for something good, and so that's what I uh, wanted to do with this project. So yeah, it's exciting to see that people are definitely gravitating towards it, resonating with it, and I, that's even at work. That's what I want to do is I want to make sure that we're giving every voice, especially the very marginalized voices, an opportunity to be heard. Yeah, most definitely. So we're going to put a bookmark in this conversation real quick. It's a great conversation. We're going to come back to it. But I want to ask <laughs> okay. you about um, a little bit more about your career because, you know, you are a guest on the show. So I had to do my research. I had to go look at the LinkedIn page. And I came across that you worked at with the Golden State Warriors, 2K Sports, the Athletic. So first of all, I want to start off at 2K, an industry that is, you know, around video games, things like that. Very male-driven, I, I'm assuming. How was that experience for you, talking about everything that you've been talking about, about being more inclusive, things like that? How was that experience for you? And were there any obstacles or hurdles that you went through that, you know, made you into, helped you become the person that you are now? Yeah, it was def it was a good experience for me. So it was um, my first, when I went to 2K, it was after I left the Warriors. And prior to that, I had always worked on the team side of sports. So I was at the Warriors. Oregon Ducks and the Timbers. So I always worked on the team side and I was ready to try something a little bit different. Um, and 2K, I think, was a good, in hindsight, uh, pivot point for me because I got to still stay adjacent to sports and entertainment and then get a lot of media and tech experience. Um, I got to do a lot of really cool things as far as partners. I was on the partnerships and licensing team. So I got to do pretty much any partner you've ever seen in NBA 2K or in any 2K games. Um, I was helping manage those relationships. And then I also was helping with music licensing, which at the time was really cool because for NBA 2K20, which is the game I worked on, um, Travis Scott was the executive producer of the soundtrack. So getting to help with the music licensing for that was very exciting and helping uh, curate the list and license those tracks was a very invaluable experience because th one thing I learned during that time is that music licensing is an extremely archaic uh, career or role that not many people know how to do. So getting that experience was pretty cool. But to your point, yeah, I mean, video game industry is definitely still very d male dominated. There were certainly struggles, but I think this can be said to any industry as far as being one of the only women in the room and trying to make sure actually trying to find the comfort to speak up. I don't think that's to say they wouldn't have um, heard me. I think I just, where I was personally at the time, was afraid to speak up and afraid to use my voice. Um, and so one thing I've learned coming out of coming out of that was to not, just not to be afraid. You know, worst thing that happens, which unfortunately happens too much, worst thing that happens is your voice is not heard. Um, but it, it's it's better to try. It, w it was a good experience for me. And ultimately, the reason why I left is because I'm not a video gamer. I admire them. Um, I play them all the time with my brother growing up, but I'm just not good at video games. And it so it was hard for me to get passionate about the product when I'm not really a consumer myself. Um, so that's ultimately why I left and went to the athletic and got back to sports. But it was a, it was a huge growing experience for me, for sure. No, I, I imagine. I imagine that series had to be super dope of working with like Travis Scott and like other NBA athletes to be like, so what kind of music you want on the game? Like, was it like that or mm -hmm. was it like you're literally sitting there with Travis Scott, like, you want this file or do you want this file? Like, like I can only imagine. <laughs> yeah, so it was more a little bit of like, um, a couple people internally curated playlists that we they felt like as. NBA 2K gamers and as people that understand the music industry and that understand these athletes, like they knew what people wanted to hear. So it was more so curating the lists, getting it approved. And then from there, we were working more with um, music managers and label companies to get the song actually licensed and then through the negotiation process. So um, a lot of the artists were probably one to two degrees away. Um, so it was definitely more of the like uh, granular process 
I wasn't as involved in the curation process. Um, but yeah, it was definitely a collaborative approach of like, what's cool? What are people going to want to hear? So you also said that you spent time with the Golden State Warriors, I think for almost four years, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So how was that whole experience? I imagine like you're in the era of Golden State Warriors. My dog was in the game. Um, I've seen the team win titles. And what, the, what was your role with the Golden State Warriors? And I, I want to hear everything about this experience because I imagine it had to be dope being around Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, and Kevin Durant and them. Yeah, so I was there 2014 to 2018, so it was very special. I mean, it was just a very special time. Uh, again, when I when I took the job, I went in with like no expectations as far as like thinking I was going to go to four finals starting at the age of 22 or win my first championship at 22. Um, but it was a really incredible time. Uh, that era a lot of our friends, like people that worked at the company, we were extremely close. And anyone that works in sports know you spend a lot of hours at work. You spend a lot of hours together. And so it was definitely a rare culture of people that all got along because for the amount of hours we spent together on our free nights, we would hang out together. And that, that certainly says a lot. We obviously really liked each other. Um, so having that helped a lot. It added us an extra layer of specialness. Um but my role there was I was an account manager for season ticket holders. So I was definitely in a relationship management role. There was a little bit of sales involved. And ultimately, the the intent of my role was to build these relationships, really help them feel connected to the team. And then the sales part came in where, you know, at the end of every year, season ticket renewals come around and you want to make sure that you have a strong enough relationship and you know the person well enough where you can ask for their credit card number and for them to spend the money that it costs. And, you know, at the time with the Warriors, those season tickets, I mean, even to this day, those season tickets aren't cheap by any means. So to ask, I, I people, to spend them, I yeah, to ask people to spend that much money, it definitely required a level of comfort. And a lot of it took knowing them and knowing Can them I well enough this? to appeal. What's up? Were there any awkward phone calls in that? I imagine it had to be something. Oh, yes. Any awkward phone calls you mind sharing? I mean, a lot of it just came around the cost because I, I, I was able, I was very good. I was very good at being able to justify the value, why you should have season tickets over buying just one off single game. Because really, when you look at the value, you save money by spending, by buying season tickets. Um, there were awkward phone calls, though, because it's, it was a lot of money. And so I was having conversations with people that were literally telling me it's either we go on a four week family vacation this summer or we, or we buy the season tickets and like we have a decision to make or like I send my daughter to college for a year or we renew our season tickets and you can't really argue with that. And so that's where it got uncomfortable. And especially it's like, I may know, like, I know you guys seem pretty well off. You can af probably afford it. But when I tell you these prices, like, some people's salaries. So it's like very, it was, it was uncomfortable combos, uh, combos for sure. Cause I could do the sales gig all day, but then it comes to the human aspect of like, I get it. This is a shit ton of money. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't even dropped like a price yet. And I'm over here thinking like a four week family vacation. Like what? Like I can, no, <laughs> I'm still in the range I mean, of like, I'm comfortable now with just getting to a week now. <laughs> so I can I only had, imagine. It was a, there are a lot. There are a lot. I'd say that. <laughs> so you I also, wouldn't afford it. Let's say that. I, I, I can imagine. I can None imagine. Combined, you probably would. <laughs> oh, so you also mentioned about how you were in this era about when they were winning rings. So I have, like, I'm, I'm assuming everyone on the staff gets a ring. Were you ever, like, flaunting a ring around? Like, you know, going around your friends and be like, hey, look at this. You got one of these? No. Um, these boxes right here, these black boxes are actually the boxes that the rings came in. Um, just the rings collecting are dust. <laughs> just collecting dust. No, the rings are in a safe, but those are just the boxes. They're pretty cool. I thought it'd be cool to display. Um, I was very nervous to wear them just cause like high value, of course yeah. I would wear them to games. Um, I would wear mine to game cause a lot of times my clients wanted to see them. 
So I would wear them because they would want to look at it. Um, and yeah, it was a nice little flex. But outside of games, I wouldn't really wear it anywhere else. It's too chunky and too too expensive for me to potentially lose or like, I don't know, someone jump me for it. <laughs> so I have to ask this question. So we're at 2K. You're not a big video gamer. You were at the Portland Timbers. You weren't really into soccer. Were you a basketball person at this time of Golden State? Or were you just like, ah, it's kind of cool to flex a basketball championship ring around? <laughs> See the <laughs> theme here. <laughs> yeah, it was um, a theme. <laughs> I, I did like basketball. I was actually a Blazers fan before I, um, before I went to the Warriors. Wow. Um, yeah, I was a big uh, – I was – so the summer I, I interned for the Timbers was the summer that I think it was the same summer Dame was drafted um, or maybe the next year. But I, I, I went to a lot of games and again, my brother's there, my family's there. So I'd always go to Blazers games with my friends. And uh, I, I, yeah, so I was a basketball fan beforehand. I was a Blazers fan. I just wasn't a Warriors fan. And of course, over the four years that changed. Uh, so I think it was like less of a learning curve than probably going to a video game company or being completely ignorant to soccer and interning for the Timbers for <laughs> summer. I mean, look, winning, what, three championships every season? Winning a championship every year you work there? What kind of make you a fan of any team? Let's be exactly. It could have been worse. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You could have been drafted first overall every single year and just be like, <laughs> I don't know if this is right. going to do it for you. Right. Um, so... Like you said, you were working at the Athletic as well. And the Athletic has really boomed into this company that has given a lot of people, a lot of writers, an opportunity to really feel value in their work. And that's something I imagine that you're really passionate about. How was your experience at the Athletic from, you know, being there for two years, but also um, being the social media manager and the community marketing manager? What were your role like at, oh, the, at those two chairs for the company? Yeah. So when I left 2K and I joined The Athletic, I first joined as the community marketing manager. And so like in a very high level nutshell, I basically um, worked to make sure that subscribers felt the value in their subscription. I mean, like with anything, and this is where a lot of the skills from the Warriors came in, where what is the value in spending money every year. Sure, the the cost compared to season tickets is much lower, but especially when there's lots of other journalism and free content available, helping subscribers understand like this is why you should pay X dollars a year to subscribe for our for our journalism. So a lot of those were like unique features behind the paywall on the app that only subscribers could get. So that's what I spent about my first year doing was developing those features with our product manage our, our product managers with our engineers and coming up with really cool things that only subscribers could get that they would care about and help them see the value of yes I could read free content on other sites but not only do I get quality journalism at the athletic but I also get all these other features that I can't find anywhere else so that's what I spent about a year doing it was a really cool um, experience and it was a huge learning curve because it was a lot of marketing and a lot of like very analytical thinking that I wasn't doing prior. I have a degree in marketing, but it was the first time I really applied some of those um, marketing lessons into my career. And then last summer, there was a need to build out the social team. And I had a really strong interest in trying to do social media full time. I had helped fill in throughout like that first year there when the social team needed help. So it was a very easy transition and I, I made the transition over. I asked to move teams and to be a social manager full time. So I did that from last summer until when I came to Blue Wire just this February. Um, and that was really cool. I really like that. It's definitely where I think I not only s developed, but helped pique my interest in just very in-depth storytelling, specifically for the athletes and the stories that just aren't being told. Um, working with the journalists were awesome. I think if anyone were to ask me what my favorite part was, it's working with the journalists. Uh, all the writers at The Athletic and podcasters are just really cool people. And that was probably the hardest part when I left was not only the friends I had um, on the HQ side, which are now still some of my best friends. We're in a group text that gets blown up all day, every day. Um, but also like the journalists, I really, I was going to miss them a lot, but we're all Twitter friends anyways. So I still talk shit and interact with them daily, but that definitely was the best part of the whole experience was, um, uh, was getting to work with the writers. 
So I gotta ask, who has the best memes in the group chat? Uh, in my friend group chat, me. Yes, we're. <laughs> It's always that one friend that has like the best memes out of everyone. It'd be like me that no one else can find. He's just like, how did you find this? Me. <laughs> my my Twitter bookmarks are pretty extensive. Oh, you never okay. know, just in case. I just bookmark <laughs> things just in case. You never know when you need it. You gotta look, you gotta keep it ready. You gotta be ready for any time. <laughs> you gotta be ready. Oh, so you you know, now you're in a position at Blue uh Bluecast, and you're also formerly with the athletic. Working with journalists and working with podcasters, how are the voices of minorities? And I hate saying the word minorities, but I can't think of another word in the spot. Um, how how was it trying to promote their voices and have their voices feel like they're being equally shared and valued as their counterparts? Yeah, so I definitely tried to put a very intentional lens on that when I was at The Athletic. Um, I had developed like a spotlight series that we did weekly or biweekly on social to really showcase the young and diverse talent at the company, specifically at The Athletic, because I think when people think of or initially join the company as a subscriber, they're, they're probably drawn to the very big names that they know. And those are the names that will, you know, bring in some and that will attract attention but there's so much good young talent at the company so I tried to make it very intentional that we promoted them because you know we there's some writers and uh podcasters at the athletic with hundreds of thousands of followers and their work will always get eyes on it but then there are some recent graduates that are just as talented but they don't have as large of a following so I wanted to make sure that they also got as much love on social media um and promotion as their counterparts. So I tried to put an intentional lens on that and was in the middle of that project when I left. But yeah, at Blue Wire, I mean, it's honestly one of our core values and one of our big mission statements is to make sure that whether it's on our network of podcasts or any studio originals, and even just the things we do from a marketing perspective or a company perspective, that we're making sure that underrepresented voices and any marginalized community have a voice, have a place to tell stories, have a place to create content. And so it's something that we really strive to do day in and day out. So real quick for the listeners out there that might not be familiar, what exactly is Bluecast? So the best way to describe it is the company has been around for about two years or two and a half years, which is pretty incredible. Um, Kevin, our founder started it um, on his own. He, also was in Bay Area sports media. And so he started uh, Blue Wire on his own to create, again, to create a place because he was frustrated with the types of stories being told. So the way I describe it, and I'm, our head of marketing used this analogy, which I find very helpful. It's very similar to like Hulu or Netflix, where we have our network of licensed content. So we have over like 150, probably more podcasts that we've signed to the network. And we've licensed that content. And then we also have our studio side, our originals, which is for us currently, we have two seasons of American American Prodigy. We have season one with Freddie Dew and season two with Ken Griffey Jr. And then we have Spencer's, our um, basketball podcast with Haley O'Shaughnessy and Jordan Liggins, who came from The Ringer. And they have a huge following. It's a very successful show for us. So I look at it as two parts to the business, our network and our studio. Um, and it's just, again, uh, a place for, we see it as like the home for the next generation of sports fans, the home for, uh, sports fans that just aren't getting the type of content served to them that other outlets just to failed to serve. So, um, yes, we're blue wire pods, but we're sort of dropping the podcast cause we want to get into video and we wanted to get into other forms of media. We have, um, a studio being built at the Wynn Resort in Vegas. So we'll start doing live events. So we'll definitely be much more than just a podcast company. And it's growing every day. It's actually quite um, incredible. Throughout my interview process, from the first interview to the time I was offered, the whole Wynn deal just happened to come about. So things are popping up every day. It's very exciting. I imagine it has to be exciting to see a company kind of blossom and groom to this thing that it is, is possibly has the potential to be. Um, so I want to go back to what we were talking about earlier about the t-shirts you designed, but more in the contrast of the incident that happened with ESPN and Rachel Nichols um, and all of that. And I am a male. I didn't, I can't see it through the same lens as a woman. So like I asked my wife, like, am I reading this wrong? Like, it, like what I had to try to ask her to try to explain it to me. Basically, she described it to me was it's something that had daily happened in offices about how 
black people or people of color or minorities, we only instead of having like a, a roof that we can put or a plateau, it's kind of like we get the bare minimum. We get the you can only get to this place without affecting me. I'll promote you as much as you can unless you don't affect me. Mm-hmm. So and I want to get your opinion on it because once again, like you have this t-shirt, you have this message, this persona about you. So what was that whole situation about and why was it so detrimental to hear Rachel Nichols speak about um, Maria Taylor in that matter and minorities? Yeah, so I woke up to it. Um, this was just what, uh, Sunday on the 4th? Yeah. yeah. So I like slept in that day, woke up to it. Truly, I like opened Twitter and saw and was like, it was one of those like, all right, back to bed. Like, <laughs> I cannot believe what I'm reading. Um, someone actually had um, in my mentions, somebody had tagged me and was like, I think you need to send Rachel Nichols a shirt. So I was like, oh, God, what happened? So I looked it up and caught up on everything. And yeah, I was definitely, it was disheartening. And I think there's multiple things that can be true here. And everyone has their perspective on it. But I think more than one thing can be true in that it is clear ESPN and honestly, a lot of other sports media companies, if we're, if we're looking at it sports specifically, has a culture problem where a culture and a diversity problem. At the same time, what she said was still, it's just inexcusable. It's just absolutely inexcusable and disrespectful to Maria Taylor. The way I perceived it and why it was so frustrating and this can be said for both the company and her herself, is it's not a competition. And I think that is my biggest thing when it comes to specifically women in sports, is it is not a competition. However, thus far and to this day, a lot of companies have created a culture where women feel like they have to compete with one another, and therefore we can be perceived as threats. And it's quite clear that that's how she felt in this instant, where it wasn't so much like, this is so awesome that a colleague and a very talented woman is getting an an opportunity. It was, she's getting an opportunity at my expense. And that's why I think it's a twofold problem is not only the thoughts that she said in private, but that ESPN had created such a culture. And a lot of companies have created such a culture where it's, it's a competition where they Feel like there's only so many spots available. I find a lot of comfort in seeing just on Twitter in the community of women in sports that I know, where we're all very, for the most part, inclusive of one another. So we know that it's not a competition, but there's still a very archaic way of thinking when it comes to both men and quite frankly, white men that have created this um, mindset that there's only so many spots. And that's the biggest thing um, is like, there aren't limited seats at the table there should always be seats at the table. And so she shouldn't feel like Maria is taking her seat. You can both sit at the table. And that's why I had such a problem with it is it's, it's not a competition. And like, that's my thing at the end of the day. And I try and tell other women in the industry or especially younger women when they ask for um, mentorship and advice is it's not a competition. There should be multiple seats at the table. And that's on us as people, um, hiring managers, and people that can affect decision making and companies to make sure that we aren't just creating like a, co- a competitive environment because that's where it gets very um it gets where it gets detrimental. Yeah, it, it does very much so. And it's very sad to see that from someone that's, you know, Richard Nichols, someone that's looked up to by, you know, mm-hmm. a lot of younger women and whatnot. And it's sad to see that, you know, what she said had effect not only Maria Taylor, but the other young lady in the situation. So I want to I want to ask you this question, and I'm pretty sure you can answer it to the best of your ability. For those companies or for those people in the space of Twitter or just their general workplace that want to be an ally but also amplify women's voices, not make it a competitive market, because you're totally right. Like it's not a competition. There's no like physical table that said that only six people can sit here. Yeah. Um, what steps and what tools would you give to someone that's looking to be a proactive ally in that space? Honestly, what I always just tell people is like what I like to do and something that I actively like to do is like when I'm asked, like in these scenarios where I told you that people were reaching out, like, Hey, you know, your shirt really resonated with our company. We want to make sure we're doing better. 
can you recommend names? Like I always want to make sure I'm recommending names. And quite honestly, I want to make sure I'm always recommending specifically black women. There are not enough black women in the industry that like the best way to be an ally is like, there's very free ways you can do these things. You can follow people's work. You can retweet, you can support, you know, when it comes to podcasts. As subscribes and saving and downloading goes a long ways. Um, you know, reading people's articles goes a long ways. Um, but yeah, like in positions of power where if you can influence or affect a hiring manager's decision, if you can um, recommend names, that's what I like to do because no one else is going to do it for them. I mean, they can recommend themselves, but when you're in the position of power and that you actually can um, influence uh, maybe a hiring process it, it's important to uplift one another's names like you can say that you're an ally but to actually do things those are very easy tangible ways that you can you can be a good ally yeah very much so and I'm so glad you brought this point because I didn't think about it until you said it about there's not a there's not enough black women's voices in soccer I mean or in sports in general I'm just using yeah, soccer as an example to this you know, sport that I look at the most, but what do you believe are the reasons behind that? Why is it seem to be this reluctance to give not only black voices but black women the platform to write these amazing articles or to be these fantastic podcasters that we know they can be? Why does it seem to be that reluctancy in the uh, industry? Honestly, I think it just comes back again to the. Um just the unfortunate like archaic mindset of there's only so many there's only so many spots and there's only so many people and i think a lot of companies if i'm just being very frank think if they hire a woman that they're like checking the right box they did their due diligence like hiring a white woman is not <laughs> it's not diversity like I'll be quite frank like great however i'm like, so are, glad like, you said that i mean that, look that as a male, I can't speak about the female aspect, but I'm so glad you said that because I'm just so glad you said that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, I'm not, that's not to discredit that there, there aren't just talented women, but like, there you can look up, you can look further. Hiring a white woman is not like a pass to check off the diversity box. There are so many talented black women in the space. And I honestly think it still comes down to just, people thinking it's competition, people thinking there's not enough uh, space. And over time, systemically, those voices just got suppressed and marginalized. And so they had to fight their own way. I follow so many incredible Black women in the space that had to create their own companies and do their own thing because the major outlets weren't giving them a chance. And now people are starting to see their work and starting to pick it up. And it's kind of like, oh, now you want, to, now you want me. You didn't want me however many years ago. And I still think, yeah, it just comes down to leadership and people at the top and not create enough spaces and make, honestly making a safe space for people to feel like they even want to join. Because I, I hear stories and like, it's those person's stories to tell, but I hear stories from other um, companies and outlets all throughout the space where maybe they got a chance, but they weren't treated correctly. So they, they left. It wasn't good for their mental health. Yeah. And that's something that, you know, over the, I want to say maybe the past three or so years has been a really positive thing about like people really checking their mental health when it comes to, you know, sharing these sports stories or, you know, being in these workplaces, like, you know, take care of yourself about anything else. Um, but Megan, this is, has been an amazing, an amazing conversation. Um, real quick, before we wrap up, and once again, I've already thanked you a bunch of times before we start recording, <laughs> but I just want to thank you again for taking of the time course. out of your day for coming on the pod. Um, I'll be here. <laughs> where can everyone reach out to you at? And if they possibly want to um, buy a shirt, we'll put um, a link in our description down below so people can uh, click on it and support you as well. But where can people reach out to you at? And if they want an advice. Sure. Yes. No, I'm actually really glad you said that. So the shirts are available at more diverse voices and sports.com. And 
And fo- yeah, follow me on uh, Twitter and Instagram. It's both at Meg Reyes underscore. I'm a very open book, like very happy to be on the podcast, talk about my experiences. And for anyone that wants to talk, um, get advice or just, you know, talk about being in the industry at all or whatever it may be, DM me. Like I try my very best to check my messages. So uh, yeah, follow me and also follow our work. Follow Blue Wire Pods because we have a lot of really cool stuff coming out. Well, that is so awesome to do. Well, as always, listeners, you can follow the podcast on Twitter at C-I-K-I-F-C. I I got to remember this because we just got a brand new Twitter (laughs) and I'm trying to remember it. So you can follow us on Twitter there. As always, take the time out of your day. Take five seconds right now. Just like, share, and subscribe our podcast. We're trying to grow this thing out. We're almost at the end of season two. We've got one more episode left. So be on the lookout for that before we wrap up season two and go start off with season three. But as always, Megan, thank you once again. I think this is the fifth time I thank you now. (laughs) All good. Thank you for having me. Not a problem. And as always, listeners, we'll catch you guys later. 